Welcome to r slash pro revenge, where revenge is a dish best served cold. Backstory, in the early 2000s, I worked for an overpriced CD store. I really liked my job, aside from one coworker, Karen. We just didn't get along. I made the best of it, but she was a borderline bully. Of course, she gets promoted to key holder and proceeds to turn into a full-blown power trip bully. She made my life torture, and a job that I previously loved, I couldn't stand anymore. I made a formal complaint that made its way to HR, but I was done working there, which was her goal. Of course, when HR investigated my claims, they found she and the assistant manager were dating. Whoops. And she was moved to another store since fraternizing was against policy. Apparently, she didn't like that store and quit. A few months later, I was happily working at defunct bookstore. And who gets a job at the defunct bookstore at another mall? Karen. Over the next few months, she proceeds to do little things to annoy me, like hanging up when I would call their store for a customer or leave me on hold forever. Of course, I would get in trouble for not effectively handling the customer with their needs. The Revenge About six months into the job, I heard through the grapevine of store gossip that Karen had been injured in a car accident. Apparently, she had hurt her back and went on medical leave. She couldn't stand for more than 10 minutes at a time without excruciating pain. This is important. She was on indefinite leave, and her store couldn't hire anyone to replace her while on medical leave, leaving them shorthanded. And I know her manager was really annoyed after a few months. Two months later, a few friends of mine and I decided to go play pool. A former coworker, Rick from the Overpriced CD store, was there. He said, Man, too bad you weren't here last night. It would have been a reunion. Karen and assistant manager were here playing pool. Karen was playing pool? Oh yeah, they come in every Wednesday night. Really? That's interesting. Every Wednesday night, huh? How long has this been going on? A few months now. Yes, for the entire time she was on medical leave, Karen was out playing pool once a week. Not at home, in debilitating pain like she claimed. The next day, I went to her defunct bookstore and asked to speak to the manager. I told him all about her weekly pool sessions and encouraged him to be at the pool hall the next Wednesday night to catch her in action. That Thursday, she was fired. The last time I saw her, she and her friend were attempting to follow me home from work. I called the police and led them into the police station where they told her to leave me alone or be arrested. She stayed away from me after that. <laughs> I hope they went after Karen for fraud because what she did was super illegal. Our next Reddit post is from Dougie Fresh. I had just moved to a new city for work and had been working here for about three months, so I am still pretty new to the area. My apartment complex, I would say, is in the nicer part of the city and is pretty well kept. So I didn't really expect anyone to go and try breaking into cars. I was set to travel and had a pretty early drive. So I had packed everything for my week-long trip the night before so that I could get up and just get on the road. The next morning, I walk out to my car and I see clothes off to the side of my car and thinking it was weird, started to look around the car. Turns out my car had been broken into and was cleaned out. Out of the trunk, they took my laptop bag, which had both my personal computer and a government computer. Two gym bags, one that had my work clothes and the other had my workout clothes and personal hygiene stuff. And a backpack that had my Nintendo Switch and office supplies in it. They also took 50 bucks out of the console where I keep change and random bills for parking. This obviously throws a wrench into my work travel. So I call my supervisor, explain the situation, and come back into work. It's my fault I left all that stuff in my car, so I had to go to our security slash IT office and explain what had happened and see what the next steps were to get a new work computer. During this meeting with the physical security manager, which was three hours after I found my car broken into, I get a call from a local number, and turns out this guy had found my laptops on the side of the road when he was coming home from visiting his mom. My bag had a contact me if found and my phone number, so the conversation goes as follows. Hey man, I found your laptops on the side of the road. I figured you would want them back. They look pretty important. Government laptops are plastered with stickers with official jargon and returning instructions. I say, for sure, I'm currently at work now, but I can come meet you or whatever works. Yeah, man, I'm coming back from visiting my mom, so I'm trying to get home so I can relax. Cool, I can make it work. Can you text me your address and everything so I can just come to you? 
I'll send it to you here in a second. It's also my birthday, so if I could get some money for like a finder's fee or whatever, I think that would be cool. Yeah man, whatever you need. See you in a bit. As soon as I get off the phone, I call the local police in that area and explain that this guy is trying to extort money from me to get stolen goods back. They instruct me to meet them a few blocks away from the residence, and they'll send a plainclothes cop and officers to act on my behalf. So I'm not in direct contact with the guy just in case since the situation sounds sketchy. I go and meet them where they go to the residence. The guy is hesitant seeing the cop cars and takes a few minutes to return the bag with the laptops in it. They bring the bag to me to identify the laptops and everything's still there. I accept the bag and got my laptops and bag back. Easy enough. On the drive back to work, no more than 15 minutes later, this guy still had my number and starts going off. Bad unreasonable spelling and he's seething through text messages on how I could get the police involved. He was trying to be a good Samaritan and he should have thrown my stuff in the grabig. Clearly he meant to type garbage. So I did the normal thing and blocked the number. Now I'm still missing everything else, including the Nintendo Switch, which was in a case with seven games. This is important. I was originally going to take the loss on it and take it as a stupidity tax since it was almost impossible to get back. However, something didn't sit right with me with this guy and thinking if he did have it, he was going to try and sell it fast and cheap. I went onto Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist searching for a Switch for cheap around the same location as his house. Bingo! The ad read, 200 bucks, Nintendo Switch with 7 games in case lightly used, no charger or dock. Must be gone today. The location was enabled and was within 2 miles of his address. The phone number was the same and the dock and charger were in my apartment. So I had a buddy of mine who lived in the next city over contact him asking if he could hold on to it till tomorrow since he wouldn't be in town until the next day and he would pay him 300 bucks instead. The dude agrees and also gets him to read off all 7 games that were there. This was to buy us more time so I can go coordinate with the police. The next morning, I get everything together to go make a case to the police to assist me with this. Police report, the Craigslist ad, the serial number from Nintendo, and the screenshots of the text messages between him and my buddy. I make my case, and the police agree to do the same thing as the day before and meet me somewhere else to go over what the plan was. I meet them and go over his address and what all I had missing. These are different officers than the day before and they recognize the address and the name. We found out this guy is known for this stuff and is currently on probation. So we come up with a plan where my buddy will call us on his work phone so we can hear the conversation and call him on his regular phone to see what's going on. The police use a plane car to go to this meetup spot and acting like my buddy, scoop the guy up and get him to cough up the rest of the stolen goods. They were able to recover all my items, including all my clothes and bags. He ends up going to jail and earns a new felony on his record for receiving stolen property. You really have to be a grab big human being to steal from someone and then try to extort them to buy their own stuff back. Luckily, this criminal is also a moron. Our next Reddit post is from Dumbaba. I grew up on a horse ranch in Colorado. We had a long piece of property, about 80 acres, and we raised Missouri Foxtrotters. We'd lived there for almost 20 years when some folks bought a strip of property way at the back of our land. It was a strange plot of land as it was very narrow and was sandwiched between our back fence and a busy country road. We were surprised anyone would buy it actually as it forced the house to be pretty close to the road. Well, we never met these new neighbors until one day my dad gets a notice from a lawyer telling us that after having surveyed the property lines, our back fence encroaches on their property between 3 and 6 inches depending on the spot along the fence line. These folks had never met us, never introduced themselves. Our first introduction was this legal demand. My father was a salt of the earth kind of man, very kind but also very strong willed. He called these folks, arranged a meet up, and tried to talk some sins into them. First, did 3-6 to six inches really matter that much? And why had they not come to us to talk it through? He even offered a number of different compromises. These folks were hostile from the get go. They demanded he move the fence immediately or they would sue. Apparently, the law stated they had to put their house a certain distance away from the fence line 
and they wanted to push it as far back from the road as they could when they built it, so they wanted that six inches very badly. I still remember when my dad got home from the meeting. He hung his hat up and shook his head when he told my mom in his slow way. Well, looks like we got the kind of folks for neighbors you don't ever want to have for neighbors. They sued and won, and we were forced to move the fence in two weeks. I say we because I was the free slave laborer, as all farm kids are in this kind of thing. All that fencing material and the time were a big cost for my family, but we got the work done in early spring. Here's where the fun comes in. So the new neighbors broke ground and built all through the end of winter and into spring. The very next weekend after they had moved into their house, dad rousted me out of the bed and we took the big truck into town to the lumber yard. I was extremely puzzled as we loaded up a bunch of fencing material and building supplies. We didn't have any big projects going that I knew about and I kept asking him what it was for. But he just told me to wait and see with a devilish smile on his face. We built a pen and a small enclosure very near our back property line, directly behind the neighbor's new shiny house. The next day, one of our farm friends delivered a half dozen pigs to their new home. Dad insisted on feeding those hogs table scraps and all the things that would go in the composter, as well as some good balanced hog feed to keep them healthy. Now, you may not know this, but the smell of pig excrement is directly related to what they eat and their pen. Table scraps make them smell bad, and I mean bad. I had to drive the four-wheeler back there every day to take care of them, and within a month, halfway there, my eyes would start watering. It smelled so bad. When we mucked out the pen with the bobcat, we also made the pile right next to the pen. I can't even imagine how bad the smell was living in that house. The neighbors, of course, freaked out, and again, without ever even trying to talk to us, went the legal route. They lost, the area was zoned agricultural, and my dad had done his homework to make sure he was breaking no laws or regulations. The pigs were far enough from us and our other neighbor that it didn't bother anyone but the people he wanted it to bother. Come fall when winter moved in, we sold the pigs to slaughter, and dad stacked up a bunch of building supplies next to the pen and let the neighbors know we would be expanding the profitable operation in the spring when they came out to scream at him. He smiled the whole time, speaking in his slow, steady way. The new neighbors sold their new house in January when the ground was frozen and the new owners wouldn't smell the pen. Though, as soon as the old neighbors were gone, we tore down the enclosure, spread the nasty stuff on the hayfield, and the new neighbors never had any bad smell come spring. They also were great neighbors and are still lifelong friends. Never mess with a rancher. But this isn't fair. When we bought property next to a farm, we weren't expecting farm smells. How could this have happened? Our next Reddit post is from The Lovely Landlord. I'm the landlord of some apartments in the city. I sign the lease agreements and go over the basics with tenants. Although they usually don't want me to spend hours delving to the fine prints. 99% of the time, it's a breeze and everything is fine. One lady, let's call her Karen, had been paying her rent via a new bank account and new checks for the last several months. All of a sudden, we got several chargeback fees on our account. She had put a stop payment on the checks and closed the account. I immediately called her. Hey, Karen, it looks like your checks bounced for the last few months. I just wanted to make sure everything is okay. Oh no, I promise I'll get this fixed. Okay, you've been a good tenant in the past, so I'll give you a month. Needless to say, a month passed and she didn't pay, so I called her again. Hey, Karen, we still haven't received payment, so I'm afraid we'll have to file for eviction. Oh God, no. I'm an old woman. I can't afford to be evicted. I'm trying so hard to pay. Can you give me another shot? As long as you pay before the court date, the eviction doesn't have to go through. The court date arrives, and guess who hasn't paid yet? At court, the judge rules for a 24-hour notice to vacate. Karen, in tears, comes up to me afterwards. Can you please give me another chance? I can't afford to go anywhere else. I'm sorry, Karen, but the only way I could do that is if you paid off the debt, signed a new lease agreement, plus a first month's rent, plus a new security deposit. And I don't think that's going to happen. Goodbye. 
So I left, and I thought that was that. My maintenance guy would come in in a few days to do the inspection and clean up, and then we'd put it on the market. He shows up a few days later, and there's a problem. They're still there. So I called the sheriff to schedule a set out. A problem, though. According to the sheriff, the 24-hour notice was no longer valid. As we had struck up a deal afterwards, so the court had reversed the eviction decision. I had no recollection of having decided that this would happen. I called the court and they informed me that the eviction was no longer valid as apparently I told the sheriff that I was giving her more time in validating the decision, etc. What happened was that Karen had called the sheriff and told him that the court had reversed the decision because of a non-existent deal. She had then called the court and told them that the sheriff could not evict her as I had waived the notice. And she had used my words, twisting my denial of an extension into a deal. I tried to give her the benefit of the doubt. I sent Karen a copy of the new lease agreement, asking for the debts in addition to rent for her first month and a new security deposit. Her lawyer then contacted me. Yes, she had the money to hire a lawyer somehow informing me that, in fact, her old lease agreement was still valid. As my deal, you know, the one that would require a new lease agreement, invalidated the eviction decision. So I filed for eviction on the grounds that she had not paid for several months now, five to be exact, and therefore had invalidated her old lease agreement. And then I read her old lease agreement. I already know these contracts pretty well, but like I said, I don't usually delve into the minutiae. This time, I did. We show up at court. Karen has her lawyer. Karen is bursting, grinning like a fool, like she's won the lottery. Her lawyer looks fairly happy as well. The judge asked me to speak. I would like Karen to leave the apartments, but she's refusing, despite the fact that according to the court's last decision, she should have left over a month ago now. The judge says, and Miss Karen? Her lawyer says, Miss Karen cannot be ejected from her home without a new notice. Yes, she has not yet paid past due rent. However, she and the landlord struck up a deal, giving her the time she needed to pay by a verbal agreement. This deal, made directly after the last court date, invalidated the last decision. So Miss Karen will require a new decision and therefore a new notice before she can rightfully be evicted from her home. Until then, her lease agreement is still valid. Insert legal mumbo jumbo. And landlord, what do you have to say? Well, your honor, I have to agree. They made a very, very compelling argument. Karen and I did indeed make a deal, giving her the time she needed to pay. And yes, her old lease agreement is still valid, I guess. Well, according to the terms of the still valid lease, there are some additional things that the court needs to be aware of that I'd like to go over for clarification. I'm sure you have a copy, your honor. Yes, I do. And you have a copy, lawyer? Yes, I do. Excellent. Well, your honor, if you look at section four, subsection A on page two, <laughs> you will see that after 10 days of non-payment, a late fee of $100 is applied. If you continue reading to subsection B, you will see that after 15 days of non-payment, additional late fees of $10 per day are applied until full payment is rendered. If you continue to subsection C, you will see that failed payments necessitate a chargeback fee of $50 per failed payment. If you will continue your honor to page four, section seven, subsection F, you will see that if a tenant is in any way responsible for a loss of rent, including leaving an apartment in less than move-in ready condition, failed payments, or lastly, refusing to vacate in the case of an eviction, the tenant is responsible for payment of said loss of rent in addition to any other debts owed. <laughs> in addition, on page eight, section 14, subsection A, you'll note that the tenant is responsible for any and all legal fees resulting from the eviction process, including attorney's fees such as for the attorney I hired to help me review this lease agreement. Finally, on page 10, the last page, section 17, subsection B, you will see that the tenant is responsible for all HVAC services rendered on their unit. As we sent in a company to fix the unit in Karen's apartment at her request, we have the invoice here for the replacement unit, in addition to the totals for all the fees listed. 
At this point, the lawyer has gone completely pale. It's clear that he was more concerned that I would fight the whole deal thing than the terms of the lease he thought he'd have to fight to keep valid. Karen looks utterly shell-shocked, her mouth slightly agape, like a child confused by a game of peekaboo. The judge, meanwhile, is completely unfazed. Until I hand her the invoice, alongside my math, a spreadsheet, and a piece of paper with the total debt owed circled and highlighted at the bottom of the page. Her eyes widened to the size of her mouth as her jaw dropped with an audible gasp. As you can see, Your Honor, the total owed is in excess of $16,000. I will happily accept the payment in the form of a cashier's check. I'd hate to have to charge yet another $50 fee for failed payment should another personal check bounce. Lawyer, do you have anything to say? At this point, the lawyer looks like he's about to pass out. Karen seems to have stopped breathing. The judge remains silent for a moment and then collects herself. I'm afraid you'll have to address the matter of debt in a different court than this one, landlord. We are here only to judge whether Miss Karen is to be evicted from her home today. Oh, if she wants to stay, I'd be happy to let her. As long as she agrees to continue to abide by the terms of the lease agreement, specifically those clauses outlined above, and pays the debt owed today. I'm going to rule for a 24-hour notice to vacate, unless Miss Karen can produce payment at this moment. Karen sits, still, quiet, speechless even. Her lawyer is eyeing the window. I like to think contemplating his decisions in life that led him to this point. Maybe thinking about jumping, I don't know. Right, a 24-hour notice to vacate. And landlord? Yes? You'll want to file those charges in small claims court, or a higher court if it exceeds the amount that you can legally pursue in small claims. Already filed, your honor. The case has now been resolved, and needless to say, I got a fairly significant bonus, in addition to a slight raise. And then OP adds a TLDR with an edit. The tenant was evicted, but lied to get out of the eviction, claiming her old lease was still valid. I then used the terms of her old lease to get a payout, at the end of it all, about $20,000. And my boss gave me a big chunk of it as a bonus. Boom. And then there's this exchange with OP down in the comments. Someone responds, Sounds like a sucky lawyer if they didn't bother to familiarize themselves with the terms of the lease before going to court. And then OP replies, I mean, essentially, they were fighting a different fight than they thought. It's akin to some guy telling you, Hey, you chew too loudly. And instead of defending your eating habits, you tell him, Oh, by the way, I banged your wife. That was r slash pro revenge, and if you like this video, subscribe to my channel because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.